You can be ready. Nehemiah chapter 6. This week I was at Hanging Rock. Uh, I was helping with senior high horse camp. And I don't know how many of you uh, know Pat and Terry Evans, but they, uh, they're the ones that are in charge over there of the horse camp. And so I was over there helping them out. I was doing the teaching for the senior high students. I did not ride a horse the whole week. That's pretty normal for me. I don't really ride horses. But uh, I was over there teaching, and so I, I get quite a bit of time with, with the campers during the day. I get one group in the morning, and I get another group in the afternoon. And we do worship together. We do uh, a lesson each day. We do scripture memorization, and then we play games, or they sleep. Uh, they, they did more sleeping this week than playing games. They were pretty tired. But uh, we, get the, we get the important stuff in, and then they get to sleep. Or they get to sleep, and then we do the important stuff. They get rid of the game time. Nevertheless, though, what I'm really, what I'm really wanting to share today is uh, it kind of goes along with, with what we're going to talk about. Uh, there, was, there was two girls that got baptized this week, one named Maddie and another named Ella. And how ironic, one of them was named Ella. Uh, and Ella was probably the smallest girl there, which, how ironic for that as well. Um, but today we're going we're gonna to look at Nehemiah 6, and we're going to look at how uh, in comparison to the last time I preached on Nehemiah 4, where the, the men try to really trip up the rest of the people that are following Nehemiah, Nehemiah 6 now, the men try to trip up Nehemiah himself. And so I see these two girls that have made this decision for Christ, and you know they're, they're at camp Sunday through Friday, and they have all this support around them, and they get to go back to the dorm every night and talk to the other girls and talk to the dorm RA and talk to Karen who was in the dorm with them. And then they've got uh, time every day to study God's word and to spend time in prayer and to even eat their meals with other people that are followers of Christ. Well, then Friday comes and they go home. And they get baptized, they go home. And I know for me, leaving camp, sometimes even that trip home, already discouragement is there. You're already talking to mom and dad and something's wrong. And it's like, I had such a good week, and you ruin it before we even get home. Well, today, before we get into the message, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go ahead and pray for these two girls. So, uh, would you pray with me, please? Father, we come before you right now, and I just want to thank you for the week that we had. I want to thank you for the decisions that were made. I know that for Maddie and for Ella, these were, these were huge decisions to, to take the rest, of their, uh, the rest of their life and to dedicate it to living for you and to, to loving you and trying to love you the, the way that you love them. I pray that you're with them today, you're with them uh, throughout this next week as they kind of get back into what normal life is going to be. But even then, school isn't there yet. And so I pray that as they get back into school, that you really protect them and allow them to, to stand out in the, in the midst of being in, in a crowd at school and not to just blend in with, with the surroundings, but to show others what it means to follow you. Uh, I want to thank you for the other campers that also made decisions this week. I know that there was a lot of tears, a lot of emotion, and a lot of decisions made on how how life was going to go when they got back home or who they were going to talk to about what when they got back home. And so I just, I pray that you be with all of them and in those decisions that were made. And not only for those campers, but for us as adults that were there, I, I pray that we hold on to those memories and we continue to share them and to, uh, to hold on to the excitement that, that we get from being around students. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You know, I became an associate because I was kind of wore out from kids. But it's weird how you go and you spend a week with kids and it drains you. But at the same time, their excitement makes you want to be excited again, even though you don't have the energy to do it. But it makes you want to be excited. Um, and so that's, that's something I won't forget from those kids. Because, yeah, they, they would come and they would want to sleep before the lesson ever started. But... When they were excited about something, and to see them smile, see them laugh, to see them 
do that with each other and then to encourage one another to, to see them work on memory verses together. I mean, one, one kid already knowing it, then helping another kid learn it. And I mean, that, that stuff just, it makes you want to come back to the church, back into your, to your home congregation and be like, what is our problem? Why are we not doing this? Um, and so that's just a little bit about my week and what I kind of went through. Uh, looking at Nehemiah 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 14 today. So go ahead and, and turn there. We'll read part of it here to get us started. Uh, looking first at Nehemiah 6, just verses 1 through 4. Let's go ahead and read that. When word came to Sambalit, Tobiah, Geshem, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sambalit and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave and let it go down to you? Leave, leave it and go down to you. Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. All right, so... When, again, last time I preached two weeks ago, I talked about, I believe I talked about, I've taught so many times since last time I preached, I had to teach every single day. Um, I believe I talked about how our enemy isn't people. The people in the world, whether they're believers in Christ or not, even if they feel like an enemy, our enemy is not people. Our enemy is Satan. Above all else, our enemy is the evil in the world. We want to be good. Goodness needs to shine through us. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. And so our enemy is not other people. Those are the people that we're supposed to be reaching out to that don't know Christ. So our enemy is Satan. And Satan really tries to get at us, to, to trip us up in two different ways. The first way is through flattery. The first way that Satan tries to trip us up is by making us feel good, making us think that we are somebody. And how quickly do kids pick up on this? That in trying to manipulate a situation, how quick do kids pick up on flattery? I, I think about when, when I was younger and I wanted something, what's the first thing you do when you go to mom and dad? Mom, I love you. Dad, you look so nice today. I don't, I don't think I ever said that. But you say something to make them feel good. And then, okay, as parents, we realize that they've already learned that too. So then what's the parent say? What do you want? More than likely, it's money, right? They want money for something or they want to be able to go do something. So the first thing that Satan does, the first way that he tries to get at us to trip us up is through flattery. The second way is through fear. So again, just like two weeks ago, I had these lettered things, this group of letters, this group of, well, flattery and fear. You got two F's to remember so far. Flattery and fear. And as parents, I think we kind of learn the fear one because we put fear in our kids to keep them from doing what they're not supposed to. We, we use the same thing Satan uses, only we try to use it in a good way. Flattery and fear. And when you think about fear, I mean, in, in today's world, there's so many things that people are afraid of. So many things. And, I mean, you'll ask some people, you'll ask them, I asked student th- students this week, what are you afraid of? And some of them will just straight up say everything. Anything you can think of, they're afraid of it. And there's, there's people here. I mean, you'd ask them the same thing, and they're afraid of everything. Other things, we saw a snake this week. Some kids, one girl about stepped on it. She thought it was a stick. But you're afraid of a snake. But why are you afraid of a snake? Because it can bite you. Because it can hurt you. And so we become afraid of things that can hurt us. Well, Satan tries to make us afraid of other things to push us into things that are actually going to harm us, that are actually going to spiritually harm us. When, when we think about um, the, the way that, that Satan get, gets at us through flattery, that, that's one thing, making us feel like we're puffed up, we're we're this good person, we're, we're okay, we can do this, and God understands. I, I hate that, that thought process, but that's, that's what he does to us. When, when we think about the way Satan puts fear in us 
to get us to do what's wrong, what, what could we possibly be talking about? Anybody have a, a situation or something where you feel like you've been through fear, been pushed to sin? Anybody at all? Make you think a little bit. Anybody want to share? I taught all week with high school students. We talked back and forth. <laughs> through fear, pushed to sin. Look at 1 Peter 5.8. Go ahead and flip there. 1 Peter 5.8. This is how we know it's true that Satan uses fear. First Peter 5.8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Okay, Peter tells us, this is who Satan is. And, and Satan is prowling around like a lion because he wants us to be afraid of him. He wants us to fear. Anybody think of anything, how, how Satan uses fear? I'm trying to give you a little more time, I'm stalling. Miles. Uh, that is perfect coming from you. <laughs> if you didn't hear him, he said, in a place where you might look weak if you walk away from something. In a place where you might look weak if you walk away. Anybody else think of something because of what Miles shared? Yeah, Sandra. If you didn't hear Sandra, she said the opposite of what Miles said. If you walk away from something because you're afraid of condemnation. Okay, so you're afraid of standing up for what is right, so you walk away. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we probably do that a lot because of the, the PC, politically correct stuff that's going on right now in our culture. Ronnie. With, with family and at work, you said? Mostly with family. Sometimes we just don't say what we know we should say just because it's, it's family. And you, you, really, you really don't want to create a rift in your family. You don't want to create a barrier. And we know we all have family members that don't know Christ. That's, that's the way life is. We all have those people that God has put in our lives that are part of our family that we know we need to reach out to. We know we need to share the love of Christ with, but yet we still aren't quite bold enough. And granted, it sometimes the best thing to do is to keep your mouth shut because you're not going to come across in the right way anyway. But there's opportunities in there where God's, God's placed them for you to speak up, and sometimes we're still afraid to. Anybody else? All right, we'll go ahead and we'll move on. All right, in 6, 1 through 4, the first thing we're talking about here is the flattery aspect of what these guys are doing to Nehemiah. But it's not just straight flattery. It's also the, the first letter here. We're going to use I's today. It's intrigue. Intrigue. The place where they're asking Nehemiah to come to, the place where they're saying, hey, come get away with us, go to this O-N-O, -O. I don't know if you say it, Ono, Ono, it's actually, it's, it's like asking one of us to get, get out of the Midwest and go to the beach, okay? This, this place is on the coast. And so Nehemiah is involved in this great project. It's been going on for days and days and days. And these guys are trying to figure out how do we get Nehemiah away from the people, how do we get their leader away so that we can then attack the people again? So we'll, we'll offer him this basically vacation to the beach. I know Connie goes to Hawaii. If she ever asked me to go to Hawaii, I'll, I'll go, okay? <laughs> These guys are saying, hey, come to the beach with us. 
Come hang out. Now, the thing that Nehemiah, re- Nehemiah remembers is these guys just a few chapters ago, these are my enemies that are trying to get the people tripped up. They're trying to get the people to give up on building the wall, trying to get the people to realize all the things that stand in their way. He's like, why are my enemies now inviting me to go to the beach with them? I I think there's something wrong. And so he takes their flattery, he takes their intrigue, and he automatically knows there's something not right about this. And so what does he say? He says, I have this great project that I'm working on, and I'm not leaving. This reminds me of another story in the Bible. When when David decides to call Bathsheba to his his place, and then is in trouble. And so he decides, "What, what can I do? How can I get out of this? Well, there's one easy way to get out of this. Bathsheba's pregnant. If I have her husband come home and go home with his wife, they'll never know that I'm the dad. They'll think Uriah the Hittite is the dad. What's Uriah the Hittite do? The same thing as Nehemiah. He comes home and he's mad at David. Why did you call me home when I'm out there fighting with my men? Well, David says, you have been working hard. You know, you need to go home to your wife. And what's Uriah do? He doesn't ever go home. He's, he wants to be back out there fighting with his men. And Nehemiah is doing the same thing. He's doing, I, I don't need to go to the beach. I don't need a vacation. I can take a vacation when I'm done. Right now, I have a great project to work on, and that's what I'm going to stay here and do. I'm not leaving my people. So, again, for, for us, for our application today, Think about the things that you have offered to you. Think about the the opportunities that you have put before you. It's it's one thing to accept something when your life is pretty simple and you don't have any great project going on. Maybe that's God's will, that you take that break, you take that vacation, and you go and you do that. Vacation's not bad, obviously. But when you have a great project in your life, something that you're working through, working on, Maybe it's a person that you're working on. Maybe it's something that you're, you have the opportunity to do at church, at work, wh- whatever, in, in, the, in a, group, a small group, and you decide, sorry, my, my vacation is more important. You're missing something. You're missing the opportunity that God's putting right in front of you. Not that the, not that the vacation's bad, but you're allowing intrigue to take you away from what's best. You're, you're allowing it to take you away from what God really wants you to do. All right, let's go ahead and let's read the next section. We're going to start there at verse 5, and let's read through verse 9. Start in verse 5 and read through verse 9. Then the fifth time Sambalat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter, in which was written, It's reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us, con- let us confer together. I send him this reply. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. You were just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. All right, this next section, the first one's intrigue. The next one we're going to call innuendo. So if you're taking notes, you got flattery and fear, and then intrigue, and now innuendo. Samuel, it goes from playing nice, from really trying to be this nice guy, trying to become his friend, to now he's starting to get tough. He's starting to, to figure out, you know, being the nice guy is not working, so I'm going to go from flattery to fear. And so we see a little bit of Samuel's true colors here. We see what, what's really behind this. What we see where his heart is. Uh, something that, that most of the time people that are trying to manipulate 
try to prevent you from seeing, but he's getting frustrated. And so now he, result, her, he, he begins to just make up lies. He's ready to spin a story in an attempt to, to get what he wants, and he doesn't care about the fact that it's a complete lie. He doesn't care about the fact that Nehemiah knows it's a complete lie. He just wants Nehemiah to see that he can make whatever story up he wants to make Nehemiah look like the bad guy. He's trying to scare him into submission. Not only did he create the lie, but then he sent the letter in an unsealed envelope. In an unsealed envelope. You, you know why it says that? You know why the Bible specifically puts that in there? Because upon delivery, he wants as many people to read it as possible. He wants the rumor to start to spread before Nehemiah even knows about it. And then when Nehemiah gets it, he wants Nehemiah to worry that it's already spread, that people are already saying this, people are already thinking it. Kind of like for, for today's age, it's kind of like posting something on a Facebook wall instead of sending a direct message. On a Facebook wall, anybody that's your friend can read it. You send a direct message just between you and one other person. And so when, when somebody is really mad at you and they want everybody else to know about it, they're going to post it on your wall. But when they're truly wanting to come to you out of concern because they want what's best between you and, and them or they want what's best for you, they'll send you a message, something that only you are going to read. And that's not at all what this guy's doing. He's saying, I want as many people to think this. I want as many people to talk about it. I want as many people to know it as possible, even though it's completely false. Nehemiah, Nehemiah handled the innuendo with a threefold response. First, he just simply denied it. He didn't, he didn't try to come up with a rebuttal. He didn't try to figure out, how can I prove that this isn't true? He just said, first, guess what? You're lying. That's it. You're lying. I'm not even going to take the time to figure out and to explain why you're lying or how you're lying. I'm just going to tell you you're lying. I'm, I'm not wasting my energy. Then he prayed about it. He, he responded, you're lying. Now let me go to God in prayer. And the last thing, he went back to work. It wasn't worth taking his, taking his mind off of what he was doing to worry and, and just sit at home and not do anything and wonder what's going to happen to me. He went back to work. There was no validity to the accusation. And so the best response is deny it, pray, and go back to what you were doing. The more that we act like something bothers us, the more that we let it bother us, the more other people start to wonder, is this really true? Have you ever noticed that before? The more that you try to argue against something, the more other people are going to start to think about it. The more other people are going to start to wonder, well, what, who's really telling the truth? What really is the truth? Just if, if somebody is saying something about you, if somebody is saying something to you that you know is a lie, just stop them and say, I know this isn't true. You can even pray right there with them. Pray about the situation. Let them know that you're offering it over to God and then tell them, I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. I'm going back to work. I'm going back to do what God has, has planned for me to do. The last section here, let's go ahead and read it. We're going to read verses 10 through 14. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had, God had not sent him but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalit had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. All right, first thing in this section that I want to note is that this guy is a shut-in. And when it says that, we have our own term for shut-in, somebody that can't get out, somebody that can't come to church. So it's someone that, as the church, we try to make sure that we're making contact with. Well, when, this, when the Bible mentions shut-in, it's talking about somebody that doesn't come out because they're different. And more than likely, he was 
he was seen as someone that was, uh, a, what's the right word? Um, somebody that has their crystal ball. Uh, fortune teller type person, thank you. He, he was seen as somebody that, that would, you know, do that type of thing. And so he stayed in his house all the time and people would come to him. He, he didn't go out ever. So he was a shut-in. And then he, he tells Nehemiah, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple. And right away, Nehemiah knows that this isn't right. Because there's only one person that's supposed to go in the temple where he's calling him to go, and that's the priest. And so because he makes this statement, Nehemiah knows that this man is not prophesying from God. Now, yes, the threat of someone coming to kill him, we know that that would have been valid. At this point, without a doubt, Nehemiah could have feared for his life. Because of all the things that he has done leading up to this point, people are going to want to take out the leader. Take out the one that's driving all these people to continue to build the wall, to finish it. They're getting so close. Obviously, Nehemiah would have feared for his life and he would have believed the threat. But he knows that this prophet is not a prophet of God. That he's making up this story. And so he doesn't allow intimidation to be the thing that takes him and allows him to go and save his own life by going to the temple. So this last eye, it's intimidation. I like how Nehemiah says, should someone like me go into the temple? Should someone like me, should a man like me run away? That's not Nehemiah's character. Throughout this entire thing, we've seen that he stands up for what's right. That he stands up to any accusation and he doesn't stop doing what he believes God has called him to do. And he's just, he's doing it once again. He's not allowing himself to fall into sin because of what one person says is going to happen. And even in listening to the one person, he still thinks about, is this really God talking to me? Is this really God, the one that's, that's trying to lead me through him? Or is it somebody that's false? There are a couple action steps we can take away from what, from what we see here in Nehemiah chapter 6. And the first one is to stay focused on God no matter what. No matter what chaos is going on in our lives. We can get busy and we can have what seems like no time for God. We can say that we don't hear him talking to us anymore, feel like he's not with us anymore. But in everything we do, we can stay focused on him and, and make our actions about living for him. Without a doubt... Nehemiah was going through chaos in his life with all these times that the guys are talking, five times, five times they sent something to him over and over and over again. And each and every time he comes back with the same response. But he was staying focused on God. Something that, that I've learned from Ava is that when she really wants something, she'll keep asking over and over and over and over again. And why does she do that? Because of it, go ahead. To break me down, so I'll say yes. Because eventually, I just don't want to deal with the question anymore. So, yeah, go do it. But what's Nehemiah do? Four times, he's asked to go to Ono. Four times. And finally, the fifth time, it's like, all right, I'm done asking to come. I'm going to just make up this lie and send it to you. And then, I, I'm, I'm going to respond, you're lying. Well, now I'm going to send a prophet to tell you that somebody's coming to kill you, going to the temple. Again, Nehemiah, you're lying too. I'm not going into the temple. I'm not going to sin. You're not going to take my reputation and throw it down the drain because I'm going to continue to stay focused on God. And so our first action step, learning from Nehemiah 6, is stay focused on God with your life, no matter what chaos is going on. Because yeah, we're hearing about what Nehemiah is going through in this little section, but don't forget, he's still leading people to build the wall. It's not done yet. And so he's got all these people that he's leading, plus he's dealing with these guys that are trying to bring him down. Without a doubt, his life is chaos. No matter how busy you feel like you are, think about his life. And he's still keeps his focus where it needs to be. 
our first action step. Stay focused on God. Second is practice saying no to the devil's temptations. Practice saying no. If you don't practice, are you going to be ready? If you don't practice, you're never going to have done it before. So what makes you think you're going to do it when, it, when the time comes. I remember back in high school when I had basketball practice for what felt like months leading up to the first game and we were still horrible. My junior year, we literally won two games the whole season. We were bad. We practiced all that time and it still didn't work out right. We have to practice saying no to the devil's temptation. If we don't practice, what makes us think it's going to go well? Again, it's not necessarily always going to be awful things that we have to say no to either. It's not always going to be something that, that you can obviously tell is from Satan. Nehemiah's trip to Ono didn't necessarily seem awful. Just go to the beach. But sometimes we have to say no to what seems good, to say yes to what is best. If you're always fulfilling the need, even here within the church, that's just missing, someone hasn't done it, maybe the church is missing out on what you really should be doing. I've, I've talked about that over and over and over again. You don't just say yes to everything that needs to be done because you're going to wear yourself out and you're not going to be fulfilling what the church really needs from you, where you really need to be volunteering, where you really can shine. There's always going to be needs. There's always going to be another place to serve. There's always going to be something else to do. But, I mean, I just talked to Kyle yesterday, yesterday or Friday, and, and he told me he went through this building. He replaced every light that he could find that was burnt out. And for Kyle, if he goes to replace a light and it still doesn't work, he's the electrician that can fix it. And so for him to take care of the lights in the building, that's perfect. That's where he needs to be because he's an electrician. Me, I would kill myself. <laughs> for Kyle, that's good. Dan, Dan's a carpenter. Again, Dan can take the doors that are in the nursery and make them look professional. I take the doors in the nursery and we're going to build new ones. You guys know what you're good at. So don't just say yes to everything. Say yes to what you're best at. Say yes to what you're best at. Today as we as we conclude, I'm just going to I'm just going to pray really and and ask God for help. Because just like Nehemiah showed us, each time that something comes his way, he doesn't just handle it on his own. He turns to God, and he prays to God for help. He prays to God that he's doing the right thing. He asks him for guidance. He asks him for direction. And he asks him to continue to remember what the other people are doing. And I don't think that's because he's just mad at the people. I think it's because he wants to continue to see that he remembers it himself. And that the next time they come at him with something, that he doesn't just forget about it and fall into what they're doing, fall into their trap. Uh, I've heard it said before that prayer, it's not necessarily all about changing God. It's more about changing us. And I have no doubt that every time Nehemiah turns and he prays after one thing happens and another thing happens and another thing happens, it's changing him and making him even a stronger leader. And so now we're going to pray. Uh, I, I'm going to pray for every one of us that as we go through those times where we are tempted by Satan through flattery and through fear, that, that we're able to turn to him and we're a better person because of it. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come to you right now and we know that Satan is going to tempt us. We know that life is not easy just because we've taken that step of giving our lives over to you and following you. We know that when we make that choice that the rest of our life, Satan is going to be even more seeking to, to flatter us and to fear us and to turning against you. And so I pray as those times come, may we, may we see what Nehemiah did and may we follow in his footsteps by first telling Satan to get away from us, 
telling Satan we're not going to fall into his trap, and then turning over to you and saying, God, please help me. Please help me continue to do what's right. Please help me to continue to say no over and over and over again, even when Satan throws the same thing at us time after time after time. Allow us not to grow weary and tired, but to continue in this life, never giving up on what we know is right, what we know is true, what we know is your will for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray.